Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are right now. Um, my name is Matthias Bünder, and it's my pleasure to guide you through this session as a moderator. Um, the session is uh, actually the second part of an, uh, the vendor independent MR sequences of the MRI uh, Together Symposium. And uh, we had the first part on this vendor independent MR sequences uh, this morning, at least in Europe, it was morning, where we heard details on Gamma Star and Pulsec and uh, an approach uh, which was integrating the acquisition simulation and reconstruction part to combine um, uh, several open source packages uh, for a whole pipeline. Um, and in this session, we will gain much more insight into uh, um, uh, other approaches. Um, uh, and uh, um, we'll have in the first hour, three, three or four presentations, uh, see at, at least three um, different environments which will be uh, introduced. Um, that will be followed by a short break. And then we will have uh, a more in-depth look at, um, at how Pulsec can be used on GE scanners that will take place in a different Zoom session, which um, you can approach from, uh, from the lounge um, uh, with an, a different link. Um, I will e explain later again. Um, please be reminded that this session is recorded, um, but now I don't want to waste much more time. Uh, and we will start with the first presentation, which is uh, given by uh, Eric Peterson from uh, Hard Vista AI. And it's on Hard Vista uh, RT Hawk. So, uh, Eric, the stage is yours. All right, thanks, Matthias. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, so, yeah, I'll be talking about Hard Vista and our RT Hawk and Spin Bench platforms for multi vendor MRI. There we go. Uh, yeah, so I am an employee and shareholder of Hard Vista. Um, so I'll be talking about you know, vendor independence. That's sort of the name of the game in this session. Um, uh, Heart Vista uh, and our approach to that, um, but also um, some background into what we do, um, how we work, what our goals are. Um, so uh, apologies if I don't get to as maybe as much technical detail as any of us would really like, um, but uh, I'll do my best. Um, so then more specifically with the uh, acquisition um, reconstruction, I'll be talking about our cardiac localizer. That's um, a pretty good example, I think. And then briefly, I'll touch on uh, control of native sequences. Um, and then I'll show you a super fast cardiac exam if we have time. So vendor independence, um, you know, they're bunch of different vendors, GE, Siemens, Philips are some of the bigger ones. Um, they're all very different. They're all different companies. Um, they even call things different names, like a, a simple gradient echo sequence can be some named very differently across the different vendors. And of course, they also have different interfaces, which all accomplish the same thing. They're there to change parameters. Um, but then also the hardware, is different across vendors, of course. Even within a vendor, they have different hardware setups, different field strengths. Um, even on a, even on one scanner, you, know, you can have different RF coils as well. So that can change a lot. Um, software is maybe more similar within a vendor, but then of course very different across the different vendors. Uh, but luckily. And part of the reason we're here, we can be here actually, is that the underlying physics is all the same. You know, they can't get around that. Uh, so you have a magnet, you have gradients, RF coils. Um, that all is what you need for MRI. Um, and then on the output side, so that's, that's the input. The output side is the DICOM image format that's become the standard to interface with PACs. So we have similar inputs and outputs. Um, and then what comes in between is really the, uh, what I'm gonna be talking about today. So uh, what we're doing at Heart Vista is we're really aiming for vendor independence, but also um, multi-vendor support. So what I mean is that we have our own pulse sequence development environment 
like the other speakers today, um, I believe. Uh, but we also have multi-vendor support, again, similar to others. Um, and we support GE and Siemens with an identical pulse sequence design, which I'll show. Uh, our solution is software only. So we connect to the vendor's hardware. Um, we just need, we need to set up a few things, of course, but then you just need a network access to the, the vendor machine. Uh, so why are we doing this? Um, you know, MRI is, is pretty slow. It's inconsistent, complex. Um, yeah, it's really very challenging. Um, technologists, especially in cardiac MRI, which we're focusing on, are they're gold. Um, you know, a good technologist can really make or break a scan. Um, you know, because MRI, each time it's really an experiment. There are a lot of adjustments. There's a lot of tuning. Some of that's automated. Some of it's not. Um, you have to plan, optimize, troubleshoot. Technologist is talking to the patient. They're trying to coordinate, like in cardiac, a, maybe a breath hold with the scanning, and they're talking and pushing buttons. So there's a lot happening, um, and we're trying to really make that more simple, offload some of those tasks from the technologists, put them on the machine, um, and do that more automatically. So to do that, we're trying to develop this uh, AI-driven toolkit, uh, which can take some of that load off the technologists. So some of the things like planning, um, you know, how do you localize, get the views, tuning, you know, changing field of views, inversion times, flip angles, things like that. And uh, monitoring also is another big one. Uh, SNR, artifacts, you know, common motion corruption. And of course, we're also doing some analysis as well. Uh, in this talk, there we go. Um, I'll be discussing mostly planning because um, I'll be focusing on the localizer, but then also a little bit of the tuning as well. So here's what it looks like. Um, start the video. Uh, so you just click go basically, and then what a localizer finds, in this case, the heart. Um, so it's running, you can see some activity. Yeah, there are the images. Um, so it's looking for long axis, short axis, three chamber, four chamber, and the horizontal three chamber views of the heart. Um, and it, this is done automatically in this case. And in about 20 seconds or so, maybe 30, it finishes, depends how many views you want. The slow thing here is really the MRI. Um, the AI is quite quick. Um, you just need to acquire enough views for it to know where to go and what to do. So yeah, I'll let it finish again here. You can watch. Um, but that's, that's the basics of the localization. And as it's doing this, it's doing a lot more, which I'll talk about next. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, of course, localizers, you know, it finds and then it shares the views with all the other um, sequences that that might need it. Um, it also can determine the field of view that we might need, like bigger patients might need a bigger field of view. Does some basic sanity checks, um, you know, SNR, things like that. Defines the shimming geometry. So we're interested in the heart here. Put the, the shimming geometry over the heart. And then it allows, uh, it's a good point to allow any interaction uh, with the protocol with the views before actually starting the rest of the protocol. Uh, okay, so that's, that's the background for the localizer. So how is this done uh, on the RT Hawk system? So we have um, our own, like I said before, development environment for the acquisition and the reconstruction. It is written in JavaScript, the pulse sequences are, um, but that's just the glue to put things together. Uh, you can do, so you can do, you know, all your normal programming logic if you need, um, but a lot of it is actually done in Spinbench. Uh, I'll get to that in more detail, but um, Spinbench lets you graphically design a pulse sequence. This is a real-time spiral SSFP, for example. 
you can you can define the waveforms, you can see the waveforms, you can see the case based trajectories, um, anything you might need for your pulse sequence development. And then you just have to define a, a UI. This is a very, very simple one. Um, most of them are more complicated, but um, put those all together and you essentially get what you need to scan. Um, and then there's the reconstruction that's also JavaScript and that just really puts together these C++ blocks. They're usually in C++, so they're pretty quick. Um, and this defines the reconstruction. So you have, you know, gridding, FFT, deapatization, um, you know, your, your basic blocks are already there. You can develop more if you like. So the uh, pulse sequence development is done in Spinbench. Um, so this is really a sequencing engine developer tool and a scheduler. Um, you can actually download this. The last bullet there gives you the link um, and that you can download the UI. Uh, that's a, it's Mac actually UI, so apologies um, for those who can't run it. But um, that's, how, that's how we design our pulse sequences. And then in the, the library side can do some of the sequencing. So once you've designed these waveforms, um, they are generated dynamically as we scan based on the design that you gave, but also hardware limitations, safety constraints, um, things like that on the system that you're running on. And the, this also allows for synchronous and asynchronous uh, updates and modifications to the pulse sequence while you're running. And then the reconstruction, I'll briefly touch on this. Um, it is expressive and efficient uh, and modular. So you're using JavaScript to put together these blocks. You can build your own blocks, put anything in them uh, and it's data driven. So um, each block looks at the data that comes in, decides what it needs to do and then passes it along to the next one. Um, so it's uh, quite fast and modular. Um, and then also you can feed back into the sequencer so you can then control the acquisition by way of the reconstruction and the data that's coming through. So what that looks like in a way is you have your UI, make some changes here, scan the sequencer, um, which you don't actually see this view while you're running, um, but this represents the sequencer, can make changes to your waveforms as you need, change the flip angle, field of view, geometry, whatever scan data comes back reconstructed and uh, is then sent back whatever you want is sent back to the ui maybe you need to make some changes automatically there and also you can send to the other sequences in your protocol as you choose um, so getting into the sequencing a little bit more um, this is sort of a typical pulse sequence um, so it sort of spans the an asynchronous and synchronous side of the MRI system. Typically, there's some pre-calculations and prescriptions that happen, uh, which is then sent to the real sequencer logic, which then um, interprets that and then keeps this queue, keeps the scan queue full. So it keeps the waveform queue um, appropriate for the scan that, that's happening. Um, and that's how sort of the standard system works. And then of course you get the data to come back. And this is proprietary um, and usually relatively high level. Um, so there are a lot of different efforts to do pulse sequence development. A lot have been talked about and will, been, will be talked about. Um, and they're done just to make things simpler, um, you know, more portable, have different capabilities, what have you. There are a lot of reasons to do this. Um, and that shows because there are a lot of different solutions here to do it. So typically that's done with you know, not using the vendor um, uh, sort of definition of pulse sequences. There's something else. So maybe MATLAB files and perhaps a UI, like in our case, Python or something else. Uh, you can in some cases, it generates the actual pulse sequence directly, which then you can run um, and potentially simulate as well, which is also very nice. Um, or you can um, develop a more sort of a sequence description file, which is interpreted on different vendors as well, different approaches, uh, both approaches to exist. And I'm sure there are others as well. 
Um, so what we do is a little bit different. Um, we've decided to simplify the sequencer logic a little bit and, and move more of the complex logic to the host. So we sort of split the sequencer in half um, and make, make the logic run primarily on the asynchronous side. So that gives a lot more flexibility and simplicity um, for, for the higher level logical operations. Like you need to change a geometry or field of view or something. And that, that allows a lot better um, interaction between the reconstruction, for example, and the actual control of the scanner and the UI. So as you make changes, those changes are represented you know, more, more directly on the sequencer. And then um, you send the appropriate commands, which are kept in, and the queue is kept full then by the synchronous side of the sequencer. Um, so that's, that's at a very, very broad level, um, our approach to this problem. So um, coming back to the localizer, so what it then contains is this real-time SSFP sequence. Start the video again so you can watch that. Um, so start, uh, we have the sequence that runs that you, we have that sequence on its own, which just in real time acquires images. There's nothing so special about that. But then in the localizer, we've added extra logic. So once you get the image, um, there's extra logic to look at the view, like, you know, it's acquiring, say, uh, the long axis view, you want to get to the short axis view, you can then ask the localizer, like, you know, give it the long axis, what is the short axis, and it'll do its best to find that. Um, and that's how, at, at a broad level, that's how it works and, and finds all these views that you like, which are specified in the protocol. Um, so in this, this tight control loop that I talked about really allows this sort of seamless switching between views and, and uh, parameters, but also calibration. So um, if you were at the scanner, you'd hear it doing this, but here you see um, it does do a quick shim, for example, at the beginning of each view. So it shims that individual geometry um, before acquiring the images. That's just one example of how we can really quickly switch between pulse sequences on the fly. Um, so we've put a lot of work into the sequencer, um, but our, our main focus is coming back to the, the AI and, and helping the technologists. So we can also uh, do, we can also control native sequences uh, if the vendor allows that. So here's an example of a Siemens scanner where we're controlling um, the vendor sequences using uh, Access I, it's called. So this right now is uh, an RT-Hawk scan that's running. You can see perhaps on the laptop screen here. Um, and then it'll trigger a vendor, so a Siemens perfusion sequence to run. And there it goes. So this, there is no contrast, but... Uh, there it starts. So you can see the images are coming up on the Siemens uh, scanner itself. So that's the Siemens scan running, and then we can get the images. And this Access I allows control of things that you'd normally see on the UI of the Siemens scanner, like you know, flip angle, geometry, things like that. So things that te the technologist would um, change, we can change using Access I. So we can integrate their sequences with ours as we choose. Um, and that, you know, that's nice because it is, it does take some work to develop a pulse sequence. So if something already exists that works well, we can just use that uh, if we want. Um, so here is a very, very, very fast cardiac exam. I just wanted to show you how it looks. Um, it, it's like, several thousand percent sped up. So it's very slow in real life, but here goes. Um, so you localize and then it just gets going and you can set up your protocol like you want. This is a myocarditis protocol. Um, and there is a pause for perfusion 
Uh, this is just a volunteer, so there's no contrast there. Um, so you do need a person to wait for the perfusion, but it just runs automatically. And you know, the geometries were set automatically. The inversion time is set automatically. Uh, field of view is changed to some extent automatically. Um, so that is uh, just the sequence of events here for the protocol. I'll just let it finish. It's only about 10 seconds. Um, and then it just runs all the tasks that it has on the protocol. And then um, you can finish up. There's some analysis that flashed up there too. And that's pretty much that. Um, so to wrap up here, um, RT Hawk really orchestrates the complete operation of the MRI. Uh, the concepts in broad terms are pretty simple, but challenging, of course, uh, details to figure out. And we really feel that new applications, especially with the inclusion of more AI and machine learning, uh, really can place more and in very interesting demands on the MRI scanner itself and really demand more performance and more capabilities. And that's what we're really trying to address. And that's all I have. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, or you, there's my email. Uh, you can send me an email. Great, Eric. Thank you very much for this uh, exciting presentation. Um, to the audience, if you want to post a question, please use either the chat or the, the Q&A um, uh, section. Uh, to write down um, your questions and uh, you can also um, directly uh, uh, contact uh, Eric. He will be around for a few more minutes to be able to answer uh, the, the uh, questions in the chat. Um, Francesco is sending, he has a lot of um, questions. Um, so number one, how heavy are the modifications to the scanner that I need to use RT Hawk? And I just unplug the RT um, Hawk computer and I can use the scanner clinically. So especially uh, uh, regarding Siemens systems. Yeah, that's a good question. So I did mention that um, you know, we it's software only, so there's no hardware changes. Um, so yeah, you don't you can just stop RT Hawk and you can use the uh, scanner normally. We just install really a um, sort of a stub pulse sequence on the scanner so we can run, um, that's how we inter interface with it. Um, so we just have the network connection. We put a computer next to the scanner computer so you can swap between them as you want. Uh, it's all pretty seamless. Great, thank you. Um, Daniel Hoinkes is asking, uh, so he's thanks for the great presentation. Um, and uh, he's mentioning that you have a strong focus on cardiac imaging. And do you plan to also use RT Hawk for other applications? Yeah, uh, the, the company history, yeah, we started out with cardiac. We're definitely aiming for other applications. Um, that's part of why we're um, pushing a little bit towards enabling the native sequences that I showed briefly at the end, um, because you go to a different application, some of the pulse sequences are the same, some are very different. Um, so we're hoping to have that sort of accelerate that process of shifting to other, um, other areas. But a lot of the fundamentals like image quality, localization, uh, that's, you know, the anatomy is different, but the, the goal is the same. So we hope to be able to really move on to other uh, body parts as well. Great. Um, I was wondering how a commercial interest of a company comes together with uh, open science and, and uh, open source. Um, could you comment on this a little bit? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, one of the things is that we do, you know, we try to do our best to present it at places like this as well. But um, so SpinBench is, is available to use. It's not open source, but um, it is available, so there's a block simulator in there. You can download it and run it. Um, and you know, we have a lot of research users who like to leverage the real-time capabilities of the system. So, um, you know, we like to provide it as as openly as we can, um, and 
let let people use it to the extent <laughs> that is possible um, with the vendor as well. So it's it, because it's the vendor's hardware, you know, we have to work with them also uh, to let people use our system. So um, yeah, we have a lot of um, people using it in interventional contexts where real time is useful. Also um, some hyperpolarized where they like to switch between um, proton and other nuclei as well. Great. Um, so uh, there are some more questions. Unfortunately, we don't have um, more time to answer the question. Maybe you can uh, just respond in the in the chat and um, in okay. the Q and A. That would be great. So thanks again.